it's always difficult to uh, to be the pioneer and, and pave the way. Um, you're taking on a lot of risk. It's much easier to follow in the footsteps of others and, and to repeat things that have been done time and time and time again. If taking risks was easy, everybody would do it. There are two sides to a risk. One is good. Well, the upside is uh, getting to climb a mountain that I've never been to, and also... The other... Well, the downside is, uh, obviously... This is Mountain Meister. Hello, everyone. I'm sure many of you are passionate skiers out there, and you know that the spring skiing season is upon us. It's my favorite part of the ski season. We recently had Brian Warren from Jackson Hole Mountain Guides on the show, and they are so gracious to offer our listeners 10% off of every ski package that they have. This is running for another month or so, so make sure you take advantage. Give them a call. Drop our name, Mountain Meister. Hopefully you know that. And they'll give you the 10% off. Also, we have some other great deals on our website under the deal section. Go to MTN or MountainMeister.com to see those. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mountain Meister. Today with me, we have Garrett Madison, who is a high-altitude mountain guide and owner of Madison Mountaineering. He has personally led 37 climbers to the summit of Everest over the last seven years, more than any other American. In 2011 and 2013, Garrett was successful in guiding climbers to a combo summit. I don't know if I'm the first one to use that term, but it's a combo summit of Everest and Lhotse, reaching the summit of both 8,000-meter peaks in less than 24 hours and becoming the first person to ever do so. And finally, his most recent credential is being named a Mountain Meister right now. Garrett Madison, welcome and congratulations. Oh, Thank you very much, Ben. It's an honor to be here. So you're born in 78, and I read you started guiding in 99. That puts you at 21 years old. That didn't take you too long. Yeah, it was before my uh, junior year in college. I was hired as an assistant guide on Mount Rainier for Rainier Mountaineering Incorporated, the only guide service on Rainier at the time. While you were in college? Yeah, it was between my uh, my sophomore and junior years, and um, I had climbed Rainier a couple of times previously, and I actually had gone on a guided climb of Rainier. That was the first time uh, I'd been up the mountain with my dad. We didn't have any of the technical mountaineering skill or experience to feel confident doing it on our own, so we signed up to go with the guide service and did all the preparations and training and laid out all our gear, and we're really excited, and I had such an awesome experience, um, and especially hanging out with the mountain guides, I thought... These guys have the best job, the best life in the world. All they, all they do all summer long is climb Mount Rainier. They're out in the sun, carrying these heavy loads, incredible views, working with great people. And uh, I thought, wow, that would be the ideal summer job. So I, uh, I took some climbing courses and did some climbing on my own to feel like I had the prerequisites to go to the guide tryouts in uh, 99 in April. And uh, they took a chance on me. They took a risk and they probably thought that this, uh, this young 20 year old kid could uh, carry loads up and down the mountain. So they hired me and it all started there. Wow. Very cool. So you mentioned your dad there. Your dad hadn't done any high altitude stuff like you do now, had he? No, my dad and I would go hiking every summer in the mountains near Seattle, the Olympics or the Cascades. And generally it was a backpacking trip to uh, try to find a high mountain lake where we could fish for a rainbow trout. And uh, I always like to scramble up to the ridge lines around the lakes and get those amazing views of the other peaks in the region. And uh, my dad eventually asked me if I wanted to climb Rainier in high school. And I thought, sure, why not? It sounds like a great challenge. And uh, so that's that's how it all started. So based on your experience with Everson Lotse in 24 hours and now guiding on K2, it seems like your risk tolerance might be higher than others and maybe even higher than other mountain guides. Is that true? Um, that's an interesting way to phrase it. I think um, I'm always trying to build upon what we've already done, what we've accomplished. And, um, 
my first trip to Everest in 2006, uh, it was very eye-opening, a wonderful experience, a great adventure, and I was very lucky to make it to the top. And um, it was tough. And then going back uh, subsequent times, um, it becomes easier. Uh, guiding the mountain became easier. Climbing it myself became easier. And uh, the mental and physical strain or stress became less and less with each subsequent expedition. Mm-hmm. And um, I think my, my risk tolerance, uh, it's definitely, uh, I, I think it it's on par with a lot of other mountain guides. Um, but I like to look forward and think, okay, well, what's, what's possible? What can we do? We've already guided Everest. Um, can we add on something else? Can we, can we add on Lhotse? Um, can we go to K2 and guide that? So I'm just, I'm always looking for the, the next uh, challenge or the next adventure out there and then applying what I know, um, what I've experienced over the years guiding um, to these new, new mountains and new situations. Yeah. It's funny when we talk about, we've talked about this on the show before, how the comfort zone can be expansive and maybe your risk tolerance in, in some respects can be expansive too. And I find myself all the time saying, how can that person do that? How can they take that risk? Or how does the person even do that? But you're exactly right. You do one thing, which opens up the possibility for the next thing then that thing opens up the possibility for the next thing, and then eventually you're there. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we build on our past experiences, exactly, yeah. and we, we build on the shoulders of others as well. So, um, you know, after being a guide on Rainier for many years and getting some international mountaineering experience on Aconcagua, Ecuador Volcanoes, Mexico Volcanoes, um, Cordillera Blanca in, in Peru, and then eventually going to Asia and um, – my first uh, mountaineering trip in Asia was to Choi Yu, and then we also attempted Amon Ablam. Um, those were all very eye-opening experiences, very challenging. <sighs> um, and and by continuing to climb and continuing to, to revisit these mountain ranges, I, I definitely feel like uh, you get better at this activity. Um, right, you know, yeah. I feel like um, just all the experience and the knowledge and, and muscle memory or whatever it is that your body experiences and learns from uh, makes it quicker and easier to adapt in the future. So I feel like now going on these big expeditions, it's it's much easier for me both uh, mentally and also physically. So if we take one like, particular example of you building on your past experience, let's say at the Everest Lotse Combo Summit in less than 24 hours, you were the first one to do it. How did you realize that there was an opportunity there and how did you make it a reality? Initially, you know, looking at Lotse on my way down from Everest, I thought, wow, what an incredible peak right there just across from high camp at the South Call. I'd love to attempt that at some point. Um, but I knew that there was no way I could do it then on my first expedition. Um, first of all, we weren't on the Lhotse permit. We didn't have any logistics in place or, or oxygen, but it's something I had in the back of my mind. And I had done some adventure racing uh, where you go out for a week with the team and you race around the clock. There's no, no stop times. You just you go 24 hours yeah, a day yeah. if necessary. Maybe maybe you sleep for an hour each night if you, if you have to, if you need to. And I thought – you know, you could do these two peaks in a similar type push, climbing one, coming down, resting briefly, and then climbing the other without coming all the way down to base camp and taking the traditional rest of a few days or a week and then going up to uh, to climb the other. So I thought, this is really possible. And a few people had tried it over the years, a few really good climbers, very strong climbers, uh, but no one had been successful. And I believe that was because of, of a couple things. One, um, planning, just having everything in place and, and having a good strategy. And, um, and the second is motivation. When you come off Everest, you're extremely tired. Everybody is. Guides, climbers, Sherpas, everyone. There's, uh, there's no disputing that. So uh, it's tough to, uh, to rally yourself and others to uh, motivate and, uh, and get back up after a rest and, and go climb that second peak. So I think there was a few things going on there, um, <clears throat> but I absolutely thought it was was possible, and I wanted to try. And in 2011, uh, the owner of Alpine Ascents, Todd Burleson, and I got together and, and discussed um, offering that as a commercial 
program at Alpine Ascents uh, in January. And so we added it to the, uh, the offerings and we had a, a couple of climbers who were set to go to Everest with us that year that were interested and wanted to uh, take a shot at it. Wow. So myself and one of those climbers, uh, Tom Halliday, ended up doing it together. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. But uh, we didn't do it again in 2012. We didn't feel like Lhotse was in good enough condition. Um, the, the mountain was very dry that year. It was, uh, there were a lot of issues, rocks coming down the Lhotse face, and we had to find a new route from Camp 2 up to Camp 3. Um, but the Lhotse Kuar was very dry and, and rocky, and there was some rock fall, and we weren't able to get the fixed lines in place that we wanted to have. And um, we decided it was too dangerous to, to guide that. So we just did Everest. And then in 2013, the conditions were good. And uh, I was lucky to, to do the two peaks with three clients this time and another mountain guide, Ben Jones, and, um, and a couple of Sherpas. So the first uh, Nepalese climbers to do that were with us as well. So it was a lot of fun. So moving on, um, let's talk about K2 because that is the new hot topic. <laughs> You recently completed a successful guided ascent with uh, Alan Arnett, Meister number 99, and I believe one other client, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yep. Are you the only one guiding on K2? I am the only one, I believe, who has successfully guided an expedition to K2. Uh, I'm the only one I know of. Uh, however, in 2015, I am aware of one other operator, uh, my friend Russell Bryce, who has a company called Himalayan Experience, who will be going to K2, so we'll be there at the same time, uh, which is great. I'm very excited to have Russell there at base camp and to be working with him on some logistics. Um, he's a great guy. I've known him a long time, and uh, I'm I'm very happy that, that he'll be there. This is pretty revolutionary, and I guess you've gotten one other person to do it. Why aren't people going to K2? Oh, I think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, it's always difficult to uh, to be the pioneer and, and pave the way. Um, you're taking on a lot of risk. Uh, it's much easier to follow in the footsteps of others and, and to repeat things that have been done time and time and time again. Um, I think uh, for a, an operator, a, a mountain guide owner operator, to take on a, a new project, um, there's a lot of logistics they have to figure out. There's a lot of risk, um, and uh, and for companies with very established programs, say they're guiding the Seven Summits or, or domestic peaks like Rainier, the Teton, or Denali, um, it's it's tough to justify taking on a new peak that nobody's successfully guided mm -hmm. um, because they've already got a very established program um, that they rely on for their their business. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it seems like you're in a pretty pivotal time even in your career as a mountain guide. You've been very successful, but this is a whole new risk. And whenever you take a risk, there's always the upside potential, but then there's also the downside potential. Let's try to identify the two of those. What's the upside potential for you taking this risk? Well, the upside is uh, getting to climb a mountain that I've never been to and also uh, having the pleasure of, of climbing that with a few good men, Alan Arnett and Matt Dupuy, who uh, summited with me, and our, our Sherpa team, who I've climbed with for many, many years on Everest and other Himalayan peaks. Um, so the upside was was to go have a great expedition, have a good time with some great guys. Do you think um, that this could be the start of something bigger, though, going forward? <laughs> Yeah, of course. No, there's a lot of climbers that would love to uh, attempt K2 if they felt comfortable enough with the uh, logistics in place um, and a proven record of, of success and safety on the mountain, similar to Everest in the early 1990s when it first became commercially guided. Um, there weren't many teams going to Everest back then, and, and look at it today. So I think if, um, if we um, have continual success on K2, uh, that will attract more operators and more climbers who are willing to pay to have logistics organized and, and put into place to go and attempt K2. Mm -hmm. And potentially, if you were on the panel discussion at the American Alpine Club's benefit dinner. Uh, for our listeners, if you want to hear that, we have it. It's episode number 106. You can listen to that. Talked a lot about crowding on the mountain in Everest. If some of these other Himalayan peaks really start to gain business, do you think that that could reduce the number of people on Everest? 
Yeah, it's absolutely possible. Um, but I think that Everest is such a unique and special mountain mm-hmm. that um, I, I don't see climbers diminishing on Everest anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about the upside potential. What's th- what's the downside? Well, the downside is uh, obviously not having a, a great expedition. Um, we're all aware of the uh, the tragedy that occurred at Naga Parbat Base Camp in um, in June of 2013, and uh, it's, that that was very sad for the climbing community. And uh, it shows that uh, the world is not a safe place. Um, and climbers um, are not left out of the uh, the terror attacks that uh, that continue to exist, and um, so that's obviously a, a concern. Um, and then the mountain itself is very dangerous. Um, you know, K two's got a, a very brutal history. Um, I think around twenty five percent of the climbers who have attempted K two, or, or maybe sorry, twenty five percent of the climbers who have summited K two uh, haven't made it back. I'm not exactly sure of that statistic. It's very high. Whereas on Everest, I think it's down around one or three percent right now. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a dangerous mountain for a few reasons. One, the weather is much more inclement um, and unpredictable. Uh, two, the chances of avalanches are much higher because of the steep slopes throughout the the route um there's rockfall potential as well and uh, it's just steep and technical and it's easier to fall if you make a mistake um you know one misclip or uh or one stumble if you're not uh, attached to a safety line can mm-hmm. result in the, an uncontrolled and fatal fall so anybody doing something revolutionary or groundbreaking always faces scrutiny. Have you faced scrutiny from the guiding community or from others for pursuing this? Sure. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about last year. Um, you know, I was at Everest Base Camp hoping to climb Everest uh, for my seventh time when um, <clears throat> the ice fall tragedy occurred, uh, killing 16 Sherpas. And I was up there the next two days trying to help the situation and, and dig some of my guys out of the ice uh, and bring their bodies down. That was very tragic. And um, and I returned back home to Seattle shortly thereafter and was guiding on Mount Rainier. And uh, I was guiding in late May. No one had summited for a few days. I was leaving a trip for Alpine Ascents. And uh, there had been some new snow and wind, and we got up to about 13,000 feet and turned around. Um and then about 24 hours later, another team that was on the north side of the mountain, Liberty Ridge, was swept away in an avalanche. Mm-hmm. And uh, both guides and all four clients were killed. And uh, so that that happened. And now I've just been very close to two tragic events. I knew some of those climbers very well um, who were involved in the Rainier tragedy. And I'll, obviously, I knew some of the Sherpas very well that were killed on Everest in the icefall tragedy. So some of my uh, guiding friends were asking me uh, if I was crazy heading off to Pakistan to attempt, not only attempt to climb, but to guide K2. They said, if the Taliban doesn't get you, the mountain will. <laughs> so uh, I definitely had some, some scrutiny, but I had a good feeling. I felt like we had planned out our uh, expedition the best we could, and, and we had stacked the deck in our favor. We had done our diligent uh, preparation, and, um, and we were going to go in there and be smart about our decisions. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did get lucky with the weather. We had great uh, climbing conditions on the route and um, we had a successful climb so let's say some of our listeners are trying to do something groundbreaking or maybe facing scrutiny from others what advice do you have what worked for you oh gosh you just have to stay true to yourself and uh, rely upon your experience your judgment your intuition um, to make the best decision and and the the more you try to uh step out of line and, and do something revolutionary or take out a, a challenge, um, the more people will be skeptical of you because as human beings, we like to follow a leader. Um, we like to go uh, in a direction where other people have gone before and where we're, we're comfortable with, um, with, with groups and crowds. It's very hard to step out as an individual and, and pioneer. But um, just relying upon your experience, your judgment, um, all of the, the data – uh, for whatever activity you're pursuing, and uh, sticking to your plan. Yeah. We just had Brian Warren on the show, another mountain guide, and we talked a lot about the sheeple effect, 
That's what he called it. Sheep plus people equals sheeple and not to follow the sheeple. But it's natural, isn't it? It's natural for us to conform to the social influences around us. Yeah, I think it's just human nature to uh, to follow the herd. Um, I see it all the time in the mountains, uh, you know, following a, a trail or a, a route. Um, we just have a lot more comfort and confidence uh, when we're with the group or following the herd or, or following um, a path that others have blazed ahead. That that can be so dangerous, though, especially in the in the environment that you operate in, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because uh, how do you how do you know and trust that the person out there forging the path ahead knows what they're doing? Right. Yeah. It, it, what do you do? Like, what have you ever found that you are following the leader? And like, if you catch yourself doing that, how do you stop it? Yeah, I think just uh, being aware in the moment um, and constantly reevaluating the conditions. You know, my job ultimately is a risk manager on these expeditions, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and when I'm up high. Um, climbing and, and we're pushing to the summit, um, I have to be constantly reevaluating the situation, the weather, the climbing route, my climbers, their health, um, and just looking at all the, all the variables, um, everything that could go wrong, the, the steepness of the slope, the potential for an avalanche, bad weather coming in, someone's oxygen system malfunctioning or someone running out of oxygen, everybody's health, making sure they're not coming down with, um, hate or haste. And, uh, it's just, constant work to uh, to manage that and i think it's easy to become complacent especially when things are going well mm-hmm. uh, and that's when we most often get into trouble um but uh, that's part of the the challenge and the fun of going on these expeditions uh, just all of the uh the moment to moment um awareness and work that it takes to um to bring everyone home safely. Yeah. You talk about um, being objective there and taking in all the variables. Did you, did you listen to the Yuli Steck and uh, Chris Bonington talk at the benefit dinner? I did. Okay. So uh, Uli mentioned something and, and so did Chris about her Sir Chris <laughs> about listening to whatever's going on inside that internal voice that's speaking to you, whether to go on or not. Uh, did you hear them talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So, so I kind of have a problem with this. I'm going to be completely honest. And the problem is that that may not the people who are saying that that has worked for them are still alive but i'm sure that there have been people out there who have heard that internal voice to go on yet they aren't here anymore because they died do, do you do you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah yeah no uh do you have an internal voice absolutely you do yeah. so help me help me wrap my head around this do you do you listen to that internal voice all the time yep so, so how does that work? How do you know that that internal voice is right? Well, you don't, um, but it seems to be right a lot of the time. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not afraid to ask for help or advice mm-hmm. or uh, ask another climber's opinion um, when I'm on the mountain. But I think it's it's that voice that we hear inside that makes us feel it's okay to continue pushing on or maybe we should turn around. But, uh, I, I think, uh, statistics or science has shown that that voice isn't always correct and, uh, we have to rely on the data. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So I, I listen to my internal voice, but I also try to be objective and, and look at the big picture as much as possible. Yeah. It's a combination of factors, I guess. Very interesting. Let's go to your gear recommendation. Uh, this is something that we ask all of our Meisters, and it can be whatever you want. That's what makes this question so beautiful. We're not going to narrow anything down. You can pick whatever you want, Garrett. So give our listeners something that they have to have or something that you're just so, so passionate about. <laughs> uh, well, if I can, I'll mention a couple of things. Yes, uh, that is allowed. One piece of gear that I've been very happy with recently is the new Black Diamond Revolt headlamp. It's a headlamp that has uh, rechargeable batteries that come from Black Diamond, and uh, you can plug it into any USB outlet to recharge. And it actually uh, lasts quite a long time and has has very uh, powerful beam, and uh, it also takes regular batteries if, if you don't want to use the rechargeable batteries. But I thought that was really cool that um, they've got something you can just plug into your laptop mm-hmm. or any USB outlet to recharge. And uh, 
the other piece of gear I would say is very important to me that I never leave home without would be my sunglasses. And, uh, Mountaineers tend to have, uh, you know, their city sunglasses and then their climbing glasses <laughs> with the side shields. And a lot of times they look really dorky. And um, <laughs> I've got one pair that I use for everything. Oh, and, uh, wow. Yeah. 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 It's a pair of sunglasses that are very, very dark. They're polarized. Um, uh, you know, I've worn them to the top of Everest and K2. Um, they're Maui Jim oh, sunglasses yeah. and they wrap around enough to where they block out all the light um, to. Uh, you know, keep my eyes from burning, but they're also comfortable and stylish enough that I can wear them on the beach or on a bike ride or wherever. So to me, that just makes it easy and simple. I've got one pair of sunglasses I, I take everywhere that um, that work in any condition. That is great. The consolidation. Yeah. Unless, yes. unless you look like a dork in both situations, that would <laughs> exactly. be a problem. <laughs> but I don't think exactly. that's the case. <laughs> anyway, yeah. the, the black diamond revolt headlamp and the uh, Maui Jim sunglasses on Garrett's Meister profile page on our website, mtnmeister.com. One one last question we have for you, Garrett, and that is who do you want to see as the next Mountain Meister? I'd love to see Tom Hornbein as the next Mountain Meister. Tom Hornbein was part of the uh, the first American Everest team that uh, reached the top of Everest along with Jim Whitaker. And uh, he climbed a different route and summited uh, a few days after Whitaker. He climbed the West Ridge, which um, is probably one of the, the greatest American mountaineering accomplishments of all time. And uh, fortunately, Tom is still with us. He was born in 1930, and he's, he's still alive today. And uh, I would love to hear you interview him and hear a little bit more about that very historic and important climb. I would love to hear that as well. The biggest challenge might be to get him to understand how to use Skype. <laughs> no, just kidding. We can connect through telephone too. <laughs> Garrett Madison, thank you for joining us today on Mountain Meister. Wonderful having you. Thank you very much, Ben. For the listeners, you can find out more about Garrett and Madison Mountaineering at madisonmountaineering.com or you can go to our website, I should say, and slash or you can go to our website, mtnmeister.com where we will have highlights of today's episode, a quote from Garrett, his gear recommendations, and anything else that you'll need. Garrett Madison, thanks. Thank you, Ben. Maybe you haven't climbed Lhotse and Everest in a 24-hour period. Or maybe you didn't lead the first guided expedition up K2. Or maybe you haven't personally led 37 climbers to the summit of Everest over the last seven years more than any other American. But there are all times where we feel like a mountain meister. And we want to see them. Post your photos. Hashtag MTN Meister on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. We'll keep an eye out for them. If you don't want to show the world, email them to us. Ben at MTNMeister.com Per usual, enjoy doing the rest of whatever you do when you listen to this podcast. I'm Ben Shank.